Welcome to Pathways, a career podcast from the Idaho State University Career Center. I'm your host, Mark Beaver. Today, we're speaking with Carl Geisler, Associate Professor of Economics for the ISU College of Business. Though Carl has always had a mind for math, there's really a few different experiences that he had in classes and summer work that really kind of led him down the pathway to becoming a professor. That, and a little bit in serendipity in grad school. Please sit back and enjoy our conversation with Carl Geisler. Hey, Carl, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you, Mark? I'm good. I'm well. I'm well. So just starting us off here, uh, could you tell us a little more about your title and what does that actually mean? What, what is a snapshot in the day of an associate professor? Yeah, absolutely. So my position has three parts, uh, teaching, research, and service. Teaching's 50 to 60% of what I do. Mainly I teach macroeconomic courses here. So that's looking at the big picture economy, what policies are available to help get us out of a recession. So people got stimulus checks last, last year. That's a big macroeconomic policy. Uh, but usually it's what we should do to keep the economy from going into a recession in the first place. So another 30 to 40% of my job is research. I'm what we call a regional economist which means my research incorporates geographic space into economic analysis. I usually look at how economic activity spills over from one jurisdiction to another, usually by looking at county level data. And then the balance of my job, 20% or so, is service. This can take a lot of different forms mm -hmm. depending on the faculty member, but my service is primarily uh, sitting on committees in the College of Business, reviewing other people's research or what we call service to the discipline, but the most visible service I do is forecasting for the state. So I present a forecast of personal income for Idaho to the state tax commission every December. And then I work with an economist from Boise State and an economist from the University of Idaho to create what's very uh, creatively called the university consensus forecast mm -hmm. of state taxes for our legislature's joint finance appropriations committee. Okay. Yeah. So all that forecasting work is designed to help policymakers know how much money we'll have so they know how much money that they can go out and spend. Yeah. So it's a lot more than just teaching. Yeah. Yeah. Teaching's half, maybe a little more than half of my job. Um, and it's probably the part of my job that I love the most. But I do like answering interesting research questions. And I really like the forecasting because it has a very tangible application. Uh, we get to see, you know, we get to tell our lawmakers, hey, this is how much money we have. Sure. Uh, and the the better we do that, the more accurately we can you know, fund all the different things that, that happen in our state. Yeah. I'm sure that adds a really nice balance, too, as well, to the job. Kind of get to jump into some different roles, use your brain in a few different ways. I guess that leads me to the next question. What, like, from, from a work aspect solely, what do, you, what do you like about this job? Just, like, what kind of what, – what does it give you? in a in a day-to-day -day aspect just from a from a work point of view so so doing those different things uh the forecasting the the research the teaching right they all kind of play into each other so you know when you go and you present to the to the legislature it's not unlike teaching right you're, you're taking what you have this this knowledge that you've come up with and explaining where it came from and why it's valid and then it goes the other way too i can take this research that I've done for the legislature and bring it back to my classes and say, hey, this is this is what we expect to have happen. Mm. And this is why. So there's a lot of kind of cross pollinization that goes on from from those different aspects of my job. And I really like that uh, it's not fully compartmentalized. OK, so I can I can build on you know, right. what I'm doing in, so in any one sector. So, yeah, even though you get to inhabit these different roles, they still all in kind of interact and influence each other and kind of gives your brain that way to work across these different uh, roles that you might play in a very, uh, like, kind of, I don't know, like, it, a very symbiotic way, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, you know, so something that we always are trying to impart to our students who are just entering college is this idea of the work-life balance, something that I know I didn't think about so much when when I was young, just kind of starting out about how 
every different job you might have will influence your your day to day life outside of that. Yeah, absolutely. So, thinking about that, what what do you like about this job? Just from like a kind of like a personal side, from like your life, your values, what you like to do on your own. How, how what does it do for you that allows you to kind of enjoy some of those parts of your life? Well, I really love being on a, a nine month faculty contract. Uh, my wife and I now have two kids under three, so our you know, summers are no longer our own. <laughs> yeah. uh, but before that, when I had a similar position to what I have now uh, at New Mexico State University, my wife and I would spend summers in Idaho picking up dropped permits and running rivers. You know, that's how we met, actually, was as river guides on the salmon. So having flexibility in the summer to do research, but being able to just put a pin in it, pick up a middle fork permit for the next day and go is... I mean, yeah, it doesn't get much better than that. Yeah, yeah, that kind of <laughs> flexibility is, yeah, is it's, amazing. It's fantastic. And yeah. then from the professional side of things, uh, I really enjoy seeing my students not only learning in my classes, but graduating and getting good jobs. Uh, Idaho State is really an institution of first access, and we've got a significant number of first-generation college students, mm -hmm. non-traditional students, people coming back Surely. that have families, they've been working for a while, they've been in the military. Um, when they get their degree, it changes not only their life trajectory, but the life trajectory of their family. So from a like a professional side of things, it's, it's so rewarding to be a part of that. Yeah, I think it's pretty amazing to be able to find a balance between kind of like those, those different parts of a job, right? You can make enough money to, to do the things you want. Uh, it gives you the flexibility to have the personal life that you want, but it's also rewarding on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, when all three of those come together, that's, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty special sweet spot, I think, that, that maybe not every job has, but if you can find one where you can, where you can get that kind of Venn diagram, that's, yeah. that's pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you had mentioned river rafting and that's how you and your wife met and i think we'll, we'll come back around to that because obviously that kind of tells me a little bit more about like maybe your interests and uh, how maybe something that was happening along your pathway but going all the way back when you were a kid what did you want to be when you grew up <laughs> that's a good question i don't i don't know that i had anything you know even i didn't have a short list um probably didn't even have a long list um, I don't know, a professional ski bum. Yeah. Um, when I started in college at Western Washington University, I started out as an environmental engineering major. Okay. Uh, and I chose that because I like the outdoors. I like doing things outside. Mm -hmm. So that's the uh, environmental part. And uh, I think math is low-key fun. So that's the engineering side. So it, it made sense to kind of start there. I took a uh, full year of chemistry, a bunch of math classes, some gen general ed classes my first year. And it was fine. Uh, my second year, I had to take a full year of biology. And the first biology class, uh, the professor studied lichen, which mm -hmm. is like that hard moss yeah. that grows yeah, on yeah, rocks. Yeah. yeah. So uh, every example found its way back to lichen. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't do it. I got a solid <laughs> C minus in that class. Like, it's just not going to just not going to work for me. Uh, about the same time, uh, I think it was like, uh, a quarter or so later, I took an econ class, and mm -hmm. I really liked how it combined a lot of this math that I was doing with the social science side of things. So mm -hmm. how are people interacting? Mm -hmm. And that combination just spoke to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think e economics is something that you can use – to explain just about anything going on in the world. It's a great lens to view world events. It's a great lens to view just about anything. Yeah. It's not the only lens you can use, but uh, in terms of being able to explain something about everything, the tools you get in economics are, are fantastic for, for just looking at the world and trying to figure out you know, what's going on. Yeah, so I changed my, my major to economics. I ended up... Uh, Majoring what what we call math econ, which is like three quarters of a math degree and three quarters of a economics degree. Uh, and, and did you know what you were planning to do with a economics I, degree? I had I had no idea. I just knew that 
I kind of liked taking these classes, yeah. uh, and it you know it, it worked. Um, my last quarter, so I graduated. I was on the four and a half year plan. Graduated in December. Mm-hmm. Uh, my last quarter, I took my final general education requirement, which was uh, an edu- like an education class. And so it was me and a whole bunch of freshmen that knew that they were going into education. Mm. Mm-hmm. It was it was really interesting, kind of you know seeing how fired up they were about teaching. And I'm you know showing up to this class like I got to be here because it's my last my last required class. Sure, I liked a lot of the stuff I learned in there, and it it kind of got me thinking, oh maybe I could go into teaching somehow. So I think the seed kind of kind of started there, uh, and I'd done some instruction uh, in in summer jobs. Mm-hmm. So I worked as a lifeguard and swim instructor for for a while. I worked as a river guide, mm-hmm. uh, and we were technically a, a guide and training program. Mm-hmm. So um, we had people coming through that were trying to you know learn more about the river. So there was always a teaching aspect there. Sure. Uh, I was an instructor at that time in uh, ski patrol, so I did a little bit of teaching there. So I'd had a little bit of experience, and I kind of liked it, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do with it. Right. Um, so I graduated and uh, had kind of a soft landing, worked as a uh, paid ski patroller for a season, mm-hmm. uh, which was a great way to kind of get back into the into the job market. Uh, and when the season ended, I got uh, a real job for a home builder in the Coeur d'Alene area. So I was a scheduler. Mm-hmm. So using kind of the more of the econ tools of um, trying to figure out what subcontractors needed to be where and when. Um, so I started that job in April of 2007, mm-hmm. and we were starting about 10 houses a week when I started there. And we peaked out a couple months later, maybe about 12, 12 housing starts a week. Mm-hmm. But in September, when I was laid off, we were starting about one house a week and, you know, looking at the long term, you know, a month or two out, we had basically nothing. So it was like the tip of the Great Recession iceberg. Mm. We were starting to see, you know, in, in hindsight, it makes total sense. Banks were starting to clamp down a little bit on lending. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, we my, my wife and I moved to Reno and got jobs uh, working retail. I worked at uh, Sierra Trading Post for a mm, year. Yeah, yeah. It was it? It was for an outdoorsy person. You get you get some good deals on yeah. the stuff you might need. Once. Yeah, it was it was good. Um, I think everyone should work in retail or, or food service. Mm-hmm. I agree. Uh, at some point, I think you learn a lot about people. Yeah. And then yeah, we we chose to move to Reno because it had a master's program in economics. I still didn't really know what I wanted to do, uh, and it also had a, a graduate program for my wife and speech language pathology. So we moved there, not knowing if we were going to get into grad school, but mm-hmm. just trying to establish residency. And then, you know, I guess we got lucky because we both got in. So you entered a master's program before a PhD pro. You, you didn't know what you're doing. I like economics. This yeah. is working for me. I'm going to see where an advanced degree is going to lead. Yeah. But still didn't really have a, a target on like a, on a, on a career yeah, I, I I didn't I didn't have a plan uh, as to you know what kind of job I was targeting when I got out. Yeah, I just knew that I liked economics and you know an advanced degree would get me you know a better job. So uh, a master's in economics is a great way to get uh, jobs for private companies or for state agencies or for federal government agencies. Everybody hires economists to do forecasting, to do uh, cost-benefit analysis. Uh, there's, all, there's all sorts of cool things you can do with, with your economics tools. Uh, I started and I ended up being a, a teaching assistant um, as, a, as a master's student. So I was teaching breakout sections of this large, like 300-person lecture. So I teach the same thing three times in a row uh, every Wednesday. And I kind of like, wow, I, I really like this. Like I could really see myself doing this. Mm-hmm. And so I, I leaned into that uh, more and more and started thinking, okay, well, if I really want to do this, 
what I'm going to need is a PhD. Yeah. Fast forward a, a, a year and a half, my, my wife's program was a little bit longer. So I was looking at graduating and, you know, another six months. But one of the options we had at the University of Nevada at that time, there was a, I was in the College of Business uh, Economics Department. There was a college of ag that had an applied and natural resources economics department, and they had a PhD over there. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we could do as master's students was take these PhD level courses uh, instead of taking the master's level, level courses. Okay. And I don't know, I guess I'm a sadist because I took a <laughs> bunch of these PhD level courses uh, and I started looking at, you know, graduating. Okay, well, if I graduate in six months, I got to stick around here for another year. And then I have to go someplace else and start a PhD program and take all of these classes again. Mm -hmm. I was like, this, that doesn't make any sense, right? right? So I transferred programs, transferred into the College of, the College of Ag and the Department of uh, Applied and Natural Resource Economics. And then like a month later, they started talking about closing down that department. Hmm. And yeah. so- <laughs> It's a fortunate time. Yeah. <laughs> The short story is they, they did end up closing down that department and firing most of those faculty. They kept a couple on that moved back over to the uh, economics department in the College of Business. Um, but when they shut that down, the College of Business said, well, we have a PhD in economics that's you know in the catalog. Let's pick up the pieces and let's start our own thing. So uh, I ended up back in the College of Business and uh, I actually ended up being the first person to graduate from this quote unquote new hmm. uh, PhD. So I think I'm the first person in Nevada to get a PhD from a college of business. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Just because, you know, right, right time, right place. Didn't plan it, but uh, it worked out. Yeah. You're listening to Pathways. I career podcast from the Idaho State University Career Center. Today we are talking to Carl Geisler, Associate Professor of Economics at ISU. Carl's just talking about his journey to becoming a professor. And earlier I talked about how teaching in different realms influenced his choice to maybe keep going down this path. So going back again, Carl, You'd spent a lot of time in the the outdoor recreation world. Yeah, it sounds like. Obviously, you seem to have a math mind as you entered college as an engineering major. Uh, I suppose you already knew that you, the math was. Some, you, what did you call it? Some what kind of fun? Math is low key fun. Okay, yeah, very low key fun. Um, <laughs> in, <laughs> in my in my opinion. I mean, um, so people do Sudoku, right? People do crossword puzzles because sure. you, you know you're working out. A problem and you're finding the solution yeah and so math is the same kind of thing if you know the process or if you learn a new process and you can solve new types of problems it's a it's you know, fun it's problem solving. It's, yeah sure. it's fun it's not you know, like roller coaster we yeah. fun but yeah. you know it's well that's it's low key fun yeah roller coasters are high key fun yeah it is different yeah um so in that though i'm just i'm curious about in that outdoor recreation world were you ever considering going down that path more? Uh, was it something that you were wondering? Did you ever think about that as a career? Because I know that's a big part of your life outside of this. Yeah. So, so at Western, I had multiple friends who were in the the outdoor rec program. Uh, when I when I looked at that program in terms of uh, doors that it opened. Um, and, and people that I knew who were you know, professional ski patrollers, mm -hmm. uh, full-time guides, uh, they didn't need that credential mm -hmm. to do what they did. Uh, but on the flip side, having a degree in, so I, at, that, at that point, you know, in math econ, mm -hmm. opens up a, a bunch of other doors, mm -hmm. uh, whereas I could still go and I had the, the hard skills to potentially go and guide if I still wanted to. So at that point in my life, I was really thinking about, and I wouldn't have used this phrase, but I, I would now that I'm a, you know, 
full fledged economist is I, I had I had a lot of option value. Mm-hmm. So having the ability to keep doors open, uh, I, th- I think was huge. And a lot of those people that got those those outdoor rec jobs, um, they, they loved it, mm-hmm. right? Um, but so I'm thinking the the two that I'm closest with, neither of them are doing that the outdoor rec thing anymore. Um, so I don't know. It, it'd be interesting to follow up with them and see kind of what their what their path was but it, it was an option I, th- I definitely thought about it sure but i also had um a pretty pretty high investment in you know all these math classes at that mm-hmm. point so you know what do you do with with that how do i turn that into a degree without having to go back and add you know two three years sure onto, <laughs> onto yeah. my college yeah, experience definitely i think that's there's there's something in there that's you know if for folks who are interested in, um, and I mean, I'd even say I worked in the nonprofit world for a while. So in, for folks who are interested in kind of going into the nonprofit world or the outdoor rec world or the outdoor education world, I think it's so beneficial in hindsight, I didn't do this, but in hindsight to maybe like minor in business or something like that, there's just a way to keep your options open to kind of grow beyond, um, you know, it's a way to grow a nonprofit. Yeah. It's a way to maybe start your own outdoor recreation business. It's a, it's just another way to kind of diversify what what kind of value you can bring to any organization. Yeah, b- business is really a part of any industry, uh, and that's something that we tell our majors um, across the College of Business is that you know wh- when you graduate, y- you might not work in an accounting firm, right? But Everybody hires accountants. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you know, you might not work for a marketing firm, but marketers work in every every major sure. you know company in in the world. Yeah, uh, economists work in every major company in the world. Right. So you know, no matter what the industry is, um, if if you're looking for a good job, I think getting a degree f- in business mm-hmm. or, or a minor in business right. is going to help you help you on that path right yeah i agree kind of a strategic coupling of a major and minor or even if someone's thinking about going back to school maybe considering tech like uh, just something in business or marketing i think from the career center uh, there's just such a large amount of our career path internships our cpis um are for marketing students yeah Um, because so many of these companies need someone with some 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 current marketing skills it's i mean it it seems like an invaluable asset to have uh, no matter what you're going to be majoring in really um so going back you had said that your time working in the outdoor field kind of cemented in you that that like you enjoy instructing and teaching that was something that gave you a lot of joy is there anything else that you think you took from that, or you still take? Because I know that you still, this is still what you do with your free time. Yeah. Is there anything else that you get from that that kind of helps you be more yeah. satisfied with your current career? Or anything that kind of helped that you brought that you bring to this career that you learned there? It's, it's definitely directed what I what I study on on my research side of things. Mm. Uh, s- space really matters. So mm-hmm. geographic space really matters. So where things are, uh, and having grown up in the West, um, traveled all over the world, uh, distance matters. Space mm-hmm. matters. Mm-hmm. And when you take uh, when you take your principles of macroeconomics class, uh, I I don't have time. We don't we don't get to talk about geographic space. We don't talk about where things are located. Mm. But where things are located and where economic activity takes place is huge. So if you talk about real real estate, right? What are the most three most important things in real estate? Location, 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 mm-hmm. right? And, and really, it's it's not untrue for just about any economic activity. Location really matters, mm. and so that's become something from you know my life. Mm-hmm. Right? I, I like being out, outside. I like doing things where I have a lot of space uh, 
mm-hmm. uh, you know, rafting through Idaho's wilderness or mm-hmm. going skiing, right? I have my own space, mm-hmm. but you got to drive to get there, right? They don't Certainly. all occur in one little space. So, I don't know, when you, when you drive across the great expanses of the West, you have some time to think about the distance that you're traversing and what does that mean for, um, for production costs? What does that mean for efficiency of industries? Mm -hmm. So I think what I do in my advocations, uh, has really given me food for thought in my, you know, paid vocation. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I was, before we started, I was, I was telling you how much I enjoy talking with economists because something you actually alluded to at the very beginning, but I have a much more social science background and mind um, and a very geographical mind as well, but in a very qualitative way. And I just love talking with economists because it seems like that is a lot of that bridge between the social science to more of a quantifiable um, idea of the world. And it's it's really the bridge that gets me to, to think in those quantifiable terms. And I just love how it opens up parts of my mind um, to, to view these things that, that I think about all the time in, in a new perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's one of the things that I find myself doing in the research side of my job mm. is, uh, you know, I'm writing a paper, I'm, I'm trying to answer a question. And usually that question is something that, okay, well, it's obvious that something happens, but What's, what's the number? Mm-hmm. So one thing that I published um, relatively recently with some co-authors from New Mexico was a, a paper looking at hate crimes in Kentucky mm-hmm. and how the Im- what's the impact, trying to quantify the impact of hate crimes on minority-owned businesses. Yeah. So minority-owned businesses are like the fastest growing segment of employment in the U.S. If we have more hate crimes and it reduces minority owned businesses that has some serious implications for the economy. I mean, not to mention whatever the other implications are, you know, socially, right. but if we can put an, an economic number on that, okay, if we have an increase in hate crimes by 10%, that's going to shut down this many more, uh, minority owned firms. We now have another, another reason if, if we needed another right. reason, but we now have another reason like, Hey, this is, this is something that we need to, go out and stop. Right. Well, it's numbers speak to everybody. Yeah. I mean, I think that's something that, um, you know, as a math brain, it's, I think that's something that a lot of math people really talk about is that everyone understands numbers, no matter where you are in the world, no matter what your political affiliation numbers talk. And so through these social science lenses, stories are, are kind of, are kind of speak, but, uh, you know, Stories can be manipulated. Stories come from a place of bias where, you know, often numbers are numbers, and that's what kind of makes a difference. I think that's what, I mean, once again, like you were saying, that's, it just makes all those things a little bit more impactful. Yeah. So, Carl, as we're wrapping up here, uh, do you have any advice for our students or career seekers? May they be, you know, midlife thinking about a new career or just starting out for the first time with with really no idea maybe they just joined a program here at isu and don't really know what they're going to do with it yeah uh just kind of reflecting back on on this conversation i think it's important to keep options open Mm -hmm. uh know when to say this isn't working for me Uh, more than one person has told me that you know one of the great things about college is figuring out what you don't want to do. So, you know, take, take classes in, in different things, take classes in economics. Uh, hopefully you learn something. Mm-hmm. Um, but if it's not, if it's not your, uh, your cup of tea, that's okay. You learned that. That's good. Um, try and take what you can from every, every class you take and, um, you know, keep doors open as long as you can, but know when it's time to, to walk away. Especially when it's, you know, if you're majoring in something and it's making you miserable, uh, that's a sign. Yeah. <laughs> you should do something else. Uh, but one thing, one thing that I don't think students should doubt is the value of the college degree overall. So mm. even if you end up going 
to college and you end up majoring, you know, you're not quite sure what you want to do with it because I certainly didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, having that piece of paper and having the knowledge that comes along with earning that piece of paper, you, you don't realize it at the time, but it opens a bunch of doors for you and it, it changes your life trajectory. So yesterday I was talking with uh, my, my macroeconomic theory class mm -hmm. about the latest unemployment numbers. And in that unemployment numbers, they, they break it down a whole bunch of different ways. And one of the ways they break unemployment numbers down is by, uh, by education. Mm -hmm. So you can see the unemployment rate for those with less than a college degree, those with a college degree, those with high school, less than high school, mm -hmm. um, consistently for the last, I don't know how many decades. If you have a college degree, your unemployment rate is substantially lower. Mm -hmm. Uh, your lifetime earnings are substantially higher. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, I mean, there's been a lot of talk, I think, in the last few years that you know, going to college isn't, isn't worth it. It might not pay off. You're going to end up with lots of student, student debt. Mm -hmm. um, that's not the case. If you, if you go to a place like Idaho State, mm -hmm. uh, we're incredibly affordable. Yeah, it's a great value. <laughs> yeah. And having that degree gives you that that change in your life trajectory um, that's not only going to change your life, it's going to change your kids' lives. It's going to change the life of potentially your parents. I mean, it's a generational move. Yeah. The, the advice I have would be to go and uh, explore and, you know, take an econ class because I'm biased. <laughs> uh, but I, I think you should you should figure out what you don't want to do, learn as much as you can along the way, and then see what happens. Say, say yes to opportunities as they come up. Great. Great. Carl, thank you so much for talking to us today. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. All right. We'll see you next time. That was our conversation with Professor Carl Geisler. I think it was interesting to hear about Carl's willingness to walk through an open door when opportunity presented itself and finding a way to balance his personal passions with his everyday career. If you're looking for information on your own pathway, please feel free to visit the Idaho State University Career Center website at isu.edu.